Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So ever since designers discussed monster revisions in Monsters of the Multiverse, it raised some concerns in the optimization community. The question I get asked most is, is there even going to be a point to taking Counterspell anymore if monster spells are being converted into actions that kind of resemble spells in all ways except they aren't called spells anymore so they can't be countered. Before I get into this, I want to thank David Skibbins. Recently, I did a video where I explained why I wouldn't be purchasing Monsters of the Multiverse as part of a gift pack, but instead be waiting till May when it is available independently. But a patron of this channel reached out to me and has lent me his copy to do some analysis. So let's go! I'd like to thank all my patrons today. Here are some specific callouts. Airhead, Alex Aquendo Vang, Alexander Baldwin, Alex R, Rob Reichelt, Awesome Face, Barbar, Ben Potts, Benjamin, Bloody Nine, Brett McDowell, Atherazone, CJ, Chris Coons, Christian Windham, Unknown Watcher, Kalinta, Daniel Sturgeon, Dank Train, Dash Panther, Dave Peters, David Edgar, David F, and David Lotz. Thank you all so much for your support. Let's get started. As I was editing this video, I noticed a couple things in terms of terminology that I thought might cause confusion or the way I talk about things. Uh, so I want to clarify them before we get started. Uh, so the first is that uh, the whole point is that there's concern that in Monsters of the Multiverse, creatures that used to be able to cast spells in combat would instead have features that are actions that operate like spells but aren't identified as spells. So, for example, let's say you had a creature before Monsters of the Multiverse and it could cast Fireball. And if it casts Fireball, we could of course counterspell that. Uh, but in Monsters of the Multiverse, maybe it would have a feature that is an action. Maybe it wouldn't be called Fireball. Maybe it would be called something like Fire Burst. But in all ways, it would operate like Fireball. So 150 foot range, 20 foot radius, 8d6 fire damage, save for half. Basically, it's Fireball, except they don't call it Fireball, and they don't call it a spell. And therefore, you wouldn't be able to counterspell it. Now, that kind of situation that I'm looking for here, I noticed in the video I often refer to a spell being replaced with an action. But, of course, casting Fireball is an action anyway, so I thought that might be confusing, because you might wonder, wasn't Fireball an action to begin with? Yes, yes, casting Fireball was an action to begin with. When I refer to a spell being replaced by an action, I mean a spell being replaced by an action that is not identified as a spell, but in all other ways operates like a spell. The second thing that I thought might cause confusion is, and it almost certainly will regardless of me explaining it, but creatures before Monsters of the Multiverse could have two different traits that would allow them to cast spells. Innate spell casting, and that would allow them to cast spells a certain number of times per day, or at will, or spellcasting, the spellcasting trait. And if they had the spellcasting trait, then they had a, you know, it w this creature is like a 16th level spellcaster, then it would have spell slots as if it was like a 16th level wizard. And then it would have certain spells known that it could cast with those spell slots. The second feature there, that spellcasting feature, no longer exists. So there is no spellcasting trait as it used to be. However, because that's gone, an eight spellcasting remains, but they don't call it an eight spellcasting anymore. They just call it spellcasting. But old habits die hard. And I noticed that when I was talking about uh, the spellcasting trait in Monsters of the Multiverse, which is the same as an eight spellcasting used to be, I often refer to it as an eight spellcasting. So if you hear me refer to the spellcasting trait in Monsters of the Multiverse as innate spellcasting, that's why. Uh, so it is now called spellcasting, but it's the same thing that innate spellcasting used to be. Okay, I want to start by saying, as a lot of players don't realize this, is that having actions that resemble spells that can't be counterspelled, they already existed. Here's the Ice Devil. This is right from the Monster Manual. So this is the first monster book printed. And I think it's the most obvious example. Right there. Wall of Ice. You'll notice it's not a spell, but it's basically the Wall of Ice spell without concentration. So having actions that resemble spells, this isn't something new. But here's what I heard about Monsters of the Multiverse. The spellcasting trait would be gone, innate spellcasting would remain, 
but would be relegated to non-combat utility spells. So like flavor spells, not stuff they're going to be actually casting in combat. Combat spells were going to be replaced and they would be replaced with actions that resemble spells. And of course, you can't counterspell anything that's not officially a spell. So suddenly monster spellcasting, at least combat spellcasting, which is where we're going to be counterspelling, wasn't going to exist anymore. Instead, they would basically have counterspell immune abilities that resembled spells in all other aspects. Now counterspell, it is considered one of the most powerful spells in the game for its level. Considered a must-have by wizards, sorcerers, and warlocks alike, it's also often a magical secret selection for bards. So if the new monsters in Monsters of the Multiverse, or the revised monsters I should say, are basically not casting spells in combat, then is there any point in taking Counterspell anymore? So I have taken a look through the book and compared the creatures to the originals, and I want to provide some examples so we can see the kind of changes that we have. So the Alhoon, this was released in Volo's Guide to Monsters, and this is basically a Mind Flayer Lich. Uh, and as we can see, it had both innate spellcasting and spellcasting. Its innate spellcasting was Detect Thoughts, Levitate, Dominate Monster, and Plane Shift. Uh, so not a big list, but some significant stuff there. Uh, and then a big spellcasting list. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But I think it's important to point out, Counterspell was on there. Uh, things like Lightning Bolt, Confusion, Evers Black Tentacles, Wall of Force, Disintegrate, Glove of Invulnerability. These are definitely spells we would want to Counterspell. Now, in Monsters of the Multiverse, this is what remains to the spellcasting trait for the Alhoon. Dancing Lights, Detect Magic, Detect Dots, Disguise Self, Mage Hand, Prestidigitation, all at will. These are definitely the kind of utility spells I would have expected. And then once a day, Dominate Monster, Globe of Invulnerability, Invisibility, Modify Memory, Plane Shift, and Wall of Force. Okay, so right away, I noticed that the list of spells is much, much smaller. But I also notice there are definitely combat spells here. I mean, Wall of Force is a game-changing spell. It has not been removed from its list. It has just been moved from being a spell slot to being a once-per-day spell. What other changes have we seen? Well, mostly minor stuff. The hit points are a little bit higher in the new version, but like 20 points higher. It's no longer immune to non-magical piercing, slashing, and bludgeoning damage, and its turn resistance appears to be gone now. It now has a 15-foot fly speed with hover, so that's a significant advantage, and I think that maybe replaces some of the spells we saw, like fly and levitate. But that said, 15-foot fly speed is pretty slow. The big thing we see with the new version is it got a multi-attack with two attacks. Now before it had chilling grasp, it could do that once, but now it could do it twice. Or it has an arcane bolt. This is a single target ranged attack, plus 8 to hit. 120 foot range for 8d6 force damage. So that's a pretty tough ranged attack. But it is a ranged attack. This is not like a saving throw spell. This is, it's got to hit your armor class, and if it hits, it does damage. So it's like a tough arrow. Now it got a new reaction. This is the one thing I saw on the Alhoon that really looked like a spell that was no longer a spell. And that is, we got a reaction called Negate Spell. It could use it three times per day. And it's just like Counterspell, except it only works on third level or lower spells. So looking at the old Alhoon and the new one, these are the kind of the conclusions I came to. So how is Counterspell doing here? Well, Wall of Force and Globe of Invulnerability, they still have them, can still be Counterspelled. These are definitely spells I'll want to Counterspell. It no longer has Disintegrate or Evers Black Tentacles, or Confusion. Those are just gone. They're not replaced with spell-like actions. They just don't exist. So instead of casting those spells, it's going to be casting spells like Wall of Force or Globe of Invulnerability, or just making straight-out attacks. Counterspell was replaced with a non-spell version, but it had a limit of third level or lower spells. Uh, now, Counterspell has a limit that if it's over third level, then you have to make an ability check, 
Here, that ability check didn't exist. Basically, if you cast a fourth level or higher spell, it can't counter it. So we can circumvent this ability with higher level spells. And actually, you know, I kind of like that mechanic. It blocks some of the overpowered lower level spells and prevents counterspell wars. Also, it makes a player character's most valuable spells counterproof. Now, it can use its new reaction to stop our counterspell. But of course, it could use counterspell to stop our counterspell before. And but then its counterspell can't be countered, but its initial spell might be countered a second time. So overall, it's probably a wash, but it's more simplistic. So would I still want counterspell against the Alhoon? Absolutely. Do I think the Alhoon is tougher now than it was before? No, no, I, I don't actually think it's tougher. Um, it probably does more damage, but has less control effects. But that's kind of a mind flare lich. Let's just get into something that's far more focused on casting. So, from Volo's Guide to Monsters, the Archdruid. So, again, we have a large list of spells. This one didn't have an 8 spell casting at all. It just had the regular spell casting trait. And you can see it had up to 9th level spells. Obviously, kind of standouts there. Foresight, Animal Shapes, Firestorm, the top level spells. But even spells like Heal, Hero's Feast, and Sunbeam, these are big spells. Also should note, it had Conjure Animals, which is a really powerful spell. And because it was using slots, it could upcast that. I mean, it could have cast Conjure Animals with a ninth level slot. The big weakness of the Arch Druid, it is a plus one concentration save. So spells that were concentration, it was going to have a tough time with. I mean, it could cast Foresight, at least it would have advantage. Okay, so Monsters of the Multiverse, what did they do to the Arch Druid? Well, at will, it can cast Beast Sense, Entangle, and Speak with Animals. Three times a day, Animal Messenger, Dominate Beast, Fairy Fire, and Tree Stride. And once per day, Commune with Nature and Mask Your Wounds. We saw some non-spell buffs to the new version. Its hit points went up moderately. Its strength went up a little bit. Mainly, it got multi-attack. That was three attacks, and it can replace one attack with the casting of a spell. So we see a mix of attacks with spell casting. And this is a theme we see over and over again in this book. And if it attacks, its staff now does an additional 66 poison damage. Now, if we look at the scimitar here, it didn't do a heck of a lot of damage. So now it has a staff, uh, does about the same amount of damage on a hit, but then we add an additional 66 poison damage. And remember, we can now attack three times with this creature. So this is a significant increase in power, but it's martial power, not spellcasting power. And the only real debuff I saw on the new version is now its armor class is 14 instead of 16. We also get a ranged attack here, and this also applies to the multi-attack. It's wildfire, it's plus 9 to hit, 120 feet, single target, does 66 plus 5 fire damage, and the target is blinded for a round. This one is pretty significant. The Archdruid has lost almost all its spells. Mask Cure Wounds might still be something we want to counterspell, but for the most part, the spells are just gone. Foresight is gone, Animal Shapes is gone, Firestorm is gone, Heal is gone, Sunbeam is gone. They haven't been replaced with anything, they're just gone. These have not been turned into spell-like actions. So, like with the Alhoon, we see a lot of spells just disappear. In this case, it's more severe than with the Alhoon. And in return, basically what they're getting is a ranged attack. Uh, and the ranged attack does okay damage, has good range, uh, and it has multi-attack. So, it's a decent ranged attack, but again, we're replacing spells with kind of martial actions. Do I still want Counterspell against Archdruid? Maybe. I could see maybe Counterspelling Mask Your Wounds. I don't know, though. But I'll tell you what. Here's what the Archdruid isn't now. We don't see any features here that resemble spells but are actions. All right, so let's go to kind of a moderate spellcaster. This is the Cloud Giant Smiling one. We saw this in Volo's Guide to Monsters. And it had a mix of innate spellcasting and actual spellcasting. It could cast Detect Magic, Fog Cloud, and Light at will, uh, three times a day for Featherfall, Fly, Misty Step, and Telekinesis. Telekinesis, a big one. Three times a day, that's a fifth level spell. 
And then once per day, each control weather or gaseous form. And then regular spell casting, you cast up to third level spells, kind of maxing out at major image and tongues. There were some combat spells mixed in there. Suggestion could be a combat spell. Tasha's Hideous Laughter, certainly a combat spell. Uh, things like Silent Image can work in combat as well, as well as Cure Wounds. But spellcasting here was pretty moderate. The main stuff it had was all innate. In Monsters of the Multiverse, this is what it has now. At will, Detect Magic, Fog Cloud, Light, and Minor Illusion. Three times a day it could cast Invisibility, Silent Image, Suggestion, and Tongues. And once per day, Gaseous Form and Major Image. And this is kind of interesting. I noted that under the features, but not under spellcasting, it had control weather, and then in brackets, eighth level spell. And it says, and this is word for word, the giant can cast the control weather spell requiring no material components and using charisma as the spellcasting ability. I don't know why this wasn't put under spellcasting as a once per day spell. Then again, it doesn't say how many times per day, so I guess it's at will. So. Why didn't they put it under the at-will spells under innate spellcasting? Maybe because they thought it was a major feature. I guess they wanted to highlight it. But one way or the other, this is a counterspellable spell. I mean, I would never counter control weather. Uh, control weather isn't a spell you're going to cast in the middle of combat. It is slow. But nevertheless, uh, officially speaking, this is still a spell. So they haven't changed it into a action that is kind of like a spell. We saw a few non-spell buffs. The one main thing I noted here is that flying with 40-foot hover was just put into movement. So once again, this does kind of replace some spells. So before we would have seen fly three times a day. Uh, now we're going to see just fly with hover 40 feet only, not 60 feet, but all the time. Uh, some minor other changes. They gave an additional plus four to perception. So the perception is now plus 11. But keen smell is gone, so I guess it's just simpler. Uh, and then hit points actually went down a bit. The rock attack was lost. Doesn't have the rock attack anymore at all, uh, but it did replace it with a different ranged attack. And that ranged attack was called Telekinetic Strike. Uh, now it's only plus 7 to hit, and it does 40, 10, plus 3 force damage, which is less damage than the rock does. Um, but they have multi-attack so they can attack twice with telekinetic strike but i gotta tell you plus seven to hit that is a big step down from plus 12. so attacking twice might make up for that but then with the reduced damage on top of that i'm not sure it's any tougher at range than it was before telekinetic strike is a more thematic attack i think for a smiling one cloud giant than rock attacks that is kind of a standard giant attack. Now they did get an action that kind of looks like a spell, and that is Cloud Step. This was a bonus action. It recharges on a four to six and allows the giant to teleport up to 60 feet in an unoccupied space it can see. So this clearly is a replacement for Misty Step. Uh, now, unlike Misty Step, this has a 60 foot range, so double the range, but we're going to have a recharge on it, so it can't necessarily use it every turn. So what are the conclusions? Well, I have to say, telekinesis was always this creature's strongest spell. Except, it's gone. It's gone. It doesn't have it anymore. There's still some counterspell candidates, like Gash's Form or Major Image, maybe. Cloud Step is clearly a Misty Step replacement. But I have to say, Misty Step is not something I'd probably have been overly excited to counterspell most of the time. I, I mean, there's always fringe cases, but most of the time, Misty Step isn't something I'm going to jump on counterspelling. Telekinetic Strike is probably not an improvement over the rock. Potentially having Fly and Featherfall worked into movement lessens the ability of counterspell to some degree. Overall, I think the Cloud Giant Smiling one got weaker. I think it's just a weaker creature than it was in Volos. I actually question here if the Smiling one Cloud Giant is any tougher than the non-smiling one cloud giant uh, because the regular cloud giant still gets telekinesis and of course it's not revised because it's in the monster manual uh, so it actually is a better spellcaster i think than the smiling cloud giant and the rock attack is stronger than telekinetic strike i think 
just because of the much improved chance to hit and increased damage. So even though you can attack twice with the other one. So yeah, this is a higher challenge rating than a Cloud Giant. And I'm not sure we're getting much for that. Overall, I think the Cloud Giant Smiling One was never a major spellcaster. Uh, so Counterspell was never a huge thing against it. And that hasn't really changed. There's a couple spells I might Counterspell. Um, but most of the time, I think it's going to be using its attacks. So let's maybe move into things that are more spellcasting based. Here's a creature we know is just totally about spellcasting. And that is the Drow Matron Mother. This was in the first Morden Canons, Morden Canons Tome of Foes. It had a few innate spellcasting abilities, including things like Levitate and Fairy Fire, and Dispel Magic was a big one. Suggestion is a reasonably sized one. And then it had spellcasting, and it could cast up to 9th level spells. It was essentially a 20th level spellcaster. Spells like Gate, Holy Aura, Divine Word, Plane Shift, Blade Barrier, Harm. Again, some big spells there. So, Monsters of the Multiverse. Now what we have, At Will, Command, Dancing Lights, Detect Magic, Thaumaturgy. Having Command, At Will, is kind of significant. Twice per day, Banishment, Blade Barrier, Cure Wounds, Hold Person, Plane Shift, and Silence. Uh, I mean, Banishment is definitely a spell. I like to counter spell. Blade Barrier 2, uh, Plane Shift 2. So, there's some big spells there. Then Once per day, Clairvoyance, Darkness, Detect Thoughts. Dispel Magic, Fairy Fire, Levitate, and Suggestion. Uh, the big spell there that I'd be interested in counterspelling is obviously Dispel Magic. And the Matron Mother got some buffs. She now has a multi-attack. She can make two Demon Staff attacks or three Tentacle Rod attacks. Now, here is a significant change. Uh, so it can make three Tentacle Rod attacks, and that sounded really amazing until I read it. Uh, the Tentacle Rod attack now just sucks, because the Tentacle Rod, of course, does almost no damage. The big thing is, you hit with it, and then the creature makes a constitution save, and if they fail, bad stuff happens. Not anymore. Now you can attack three times with it. It still does almost no damage, but you have to hit all three times for the secondary effect to happen, meaning it's almost never going to happen. So, yeah, the Tentacle Rod attack just terrible now. I don't know why the Drow Mage and Mother would ever use it. Basically, it's got to use its Demon Staff. Uh, it gets only two attacks with the Demon Staff. Does regular Staff damage plus 46 Psychic damage, so at least it does some damage. Uh, and then the creature makes a DC 19 Wisdom Saving Throw. If they fail, they're frightened, and they are frightened for a minute, but they get a saving throw every round. So the Demon Staff is just so much better than the Tentacle Rod. The Tentacle Rod I don't know what they were thinking with that. Now, I will say it does get one action that looks like a spell. That is Divine Flame. This is twice per day, and it's essentially Flame Strike. So the Drow Matron Mother now has Flame Strike, which is actually kind of a sucky spell for its level. Against a low-level party, it's still a reasonable amount. Of, I mean, it's Fireball damage, basically, uh, in a much, much smaller area. And it will be able to use it twice per day, and it can't be countered. New Matron Mother really sucks now. Uh, I don't know why this is CR 20. I mean, no Holy Aura, no Harm, no Spirit Guardians. The Tentacle Rod is now really, really bad. As for Counterspell, we can still counter Blade Barrier, Banishment, Dispel Magic. So I still like Counterspell against this creature. I can't counter Flame Strike anymore. And honestly... Uh, the, very truly, if I heard the spell I countered from a Drow Matron Mother was Flame Strike, I'd probably be disappointed. I mean, we're talking about a 20th level spellcaster, so I'm not sure that's a bad thing. I'd rather counter Blade Barrier Banishment or Dispel Magic than Flame Strike. So uh, I still want counter here, but I'm not sure why they made the Drow Matron Mother so crappy now. Wow, not good. But let's move on to another major creature, the Elder Brain. This was in Volos, and at will it could do Detect Thoughts, Levitate, and once per day, Dominate Monster, which was always scary, and Plane Shift on itself, which could give it a quick getaway. We definitely want to be able to uh, counter some of those. And with the Monsters of the Multiverse, we now have at will, Detect Thoughts, and Levitate. 
Hmm, that's the same. And then once per day each, dominate monster, plane shift, self only. So that's the same. Here's the thing that I wanted to bring Elder Brain up for is we also get three times per day modify memory. So why is modify memory suddenly added to the Elder Brain? I just thought this was interesting because what we see here is the reverse of what we were told to expect. Because if we look here at sense thoughts, this used to allow the Elder Brain to modify memories, but no more. Now the Elder Brain casts the Modify Memory spell instead. So here we actually saw an action that resembled a spell replaced by a spell. So the exact opposite of what we were worried about. Not that I'm probably countering Modify Memory either, but I just thought it was interesting to see that this isn't all spells turning into actions. In fact, for the most part, spells are not turning into actions. But here we actually saw an action turn into a spell. So the Nagpa was introduced in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. Now, do you remember at the beginning of this video when I talked about Ice Devils and being able to use Wall of Ice and it was an action but not identified as a spell? Here we actually see something very similar. If we look at Paralyzation, that looks an awful lot like Hold Monster, except not identified as a spell. And like with Wall of Ice, no concentration. And I just want to point out, this is the Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes version. So once again, we see an example of a creature that had an ability that looks like a spell, acts like a spell, but it's not officially a spell. So the original Nagpa, 15th level spellcaster, used intelligence as its spellcasting ability, and it had up to 8th level spells, including Feeble Mind, Etherealness, Prismatic Spray, Circle of Death, Disintegrate, Dominate Person, uh, and the list goes on. They had a, actually a big list of spells that they might want to cast in combat, including Counterspell. So what do we see in Monsters of the Multiverse? Well, at will, Detect Magic, Mage Hand, Message, Minor Illusion, Twice per Day, Fireball, Fly, Hold Person, Suggestion, Wall of Fire, definitely some Counterspell candidates there, and once per day, dominate person, etherealness, and feeble mind. I would definitely want to counterspell all of those if they were being cast in combat. Uh, now we see 16 more hit points on the new version, but mainly the biggest buff over the original version is we see a multi attack, which includes a spell casting option. The staff it uses does more damage, but its main attack is probably now its deathly ray, which is a new attack, plus 12 to hit, 120 foot range. 30 damage on average, and it can make three attacks, or we could make two attacks and cast a spell. So if I was to look at this original Nagpa, the big counter spell I want to do is on Feeble Mind, uh, but also on Fireball, counterspelling their counter spell, Confusion, Disintegrate, Dominate Person, Wall of Fire. I mean, actually, the list goes on. There's a lot of spells here I would want to counter. On the new Nagpa, it's Dominate, Etherealness, Feeble Mind, Wall of Fire, and Fireball. I mean, maybe even Suggestion and Hold Person, kind of depending on our situation. The list is definitely smaller, but we are absolutely going to be facing spells we want to counter, except the Nagpa can no longer counter our counter spell. So our counter spell against the new Nagpa in Monsters of the Multiverse is more effective than ever before. And we follow the same pattern as the book goes on. So these are kind of the overall findings I had. First, there are some spells that have been converted into spell-like actions. Though they tend to be spells I wouldn't have counterspelled anyways. And some of them have pretty significant reductions in power. Second, creatures that previously had spellcasting still have spellcasting. But what they tend to add is a straight attack option. And it tends to be a ranged attack option. So armor class and cover, as always, is important, but probably even more important for ranged characters now than before. Third, uh, when I heard Jeremy Crawford talk about the monsters in Monsters of the Multiverse, I got the idea that spellcasting creatures were going to be more dangerous than ever before. Now, reviewing what he had to say again, uh, he actually wasn't talking about spellcasting creatures specifically. He was actually talking about higher challenge rating creatures uh, hitting harder than they had before. And actually, I guess I do agree with that because these creatures do hit harder. Like the Drow Matron Mother hits you with her staff 
that does hit harder. Uh, but if you know what you're doing with spells, then hitting things with weapons was never the best thing she could do. And now there's just so many fewer options. I could swear that that is a less challenging creature than it was before, despite being the same challenge rating. They are certainly easier to play than ever before, and I do think that will make them more dangerous in the hands of some DMs. Overall, the spell lists are way smaller, and we replace that with some multi-attack options, but not much in the way of spell-like actions. If we have optimized characters that have those great armor classes, they're not going to be overly afraid of these attack options. But finally, and the whole purpose of this video, I think Counterspell is still going to be a must when available. Creatures absolutely still get combat-based spells. The rumor that they weren't going to have combat-based spells was false. They absolutely still have combat-based spells. They have a reduced number of them, but this is still often the most powerful thing they can do. And, for the most part, these spells haven't been converted into spell-like actions. Instead, they're either converted into innate spellcasting, now called spellcasting, or removed entirely. But I will say this, although I still find that these monsters have combat spells, clearly combat spells, that they're clearly going to be casting in combat, when you have something like multi-attack, now including spellcasting, so creatures here that can do weapon attacks or uh, other kinds of actions, and then include a spell as well as part of a multi-attack, I could see Counterspell maybe being less dramatic. Like, for example, if you have something that can cast Wall of Force, and it also has a ranged attack option, and now it has multi-attack, and it can replace one of those attacks with a spell, it could do that ranged attack option and a Wall of Force. And if we counterspell, we counterspell the Wall of Force, but the ranged attack still occurs. So instead of completely shutting it down, we just shut down the spell. So I do see situations where counterspell might be less dramatic than it was before, but assuming the spell was a good spell, it's probably significantly more powerful than the ranged attack. So it's still going to be a pretty big deal. Now I talked a little bit about innate spellcasting not existing as a trait anymore. Now it's just called the spellcasting trait, but it operates like innate spellcasting used to. There's actually an interesting interaction I noted that is bad news for ninth level casters. So this is the shape change spell. It says that when we cast the shape change spell, the creature we select can't be a construct or undead. We must have seen that sort of creature at least once. We transform into an average example of that creature, one without any class levels, or the spellcasting trait. Now, this was interesting because before, the spellcasting trait referred to class level spells, uh, and innate spellcasting was a different trait altogether. And you could access a creature with the innate spellcasting trait and get access to spells that way. But according to the wording of Shape Change now, unless they do some errata, the spellcasting trait now is what used to be innate spellcasting. Now that is not available through shape change, which means we're not going to be able to access any spells through shape change. Now, if we do transform into a creature that has like an action that looks like a spell, that maybe used to be a spell, like some of the ones we talked about before, then we should still be able to use those. Uh, but in terms of actually accessing spells now, uh, shape change has been completely shut down, at least in regards to the new creatures in Monsters of the Multiverse, and presumably any publications after that. So that's it. Counterspell, I don't think it has become obsolete. Still going to be really effective, still going to be something I'm absolutely going to grab. But I'm also going to make sure my armor class is really good, because these creatures have a lot more attacks than they had before, and less spells. Thanks everyone. That's my first Monsters of the Multiverse video down, and there's more to come. So until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon.